Good evening. This is John Atkinson and Graham Jordison with John Pollock <laughs> here for the Environment Report on 1690 AM. Thank you all for joining us for another evening of, well, who knows? Let me look at my list. We do have people on tonight. We've got uh, John Pollock, obviously, our um, res resident weather forecaster and um, um, weather and climate expert. We'll have a report from the Keystone XL pipeline hearing that was held by the, the State Department last week in Grand Island, Nebraska. That's a very national story and of intense interest to those of us here in Nebraska. Uh, we'll have that report from Adam Hintz, uh, who will call in from Lincoln. And we also will have on the phone for us Mary Beth Gardham with Move to Amend, which will bring in, uh, let us talk about a number of things that uh, we'll let her define. But I got to tell you, there's an active question. Can we solve the climate problem without solving the democracy problem? Can we solve the climate problem? problem before it undermines democracy itself. That's that's a pretty intense and urgent question. So we have uh, what we think is some pretty exciting topics and qualified people, people who are directly involved uh, for you this evening. And uh, you know Mary Beth, don't yeah, you? Yeah, Mary Beth's a good friend of mine from Iowa. I met her years ago. As far as I know, she's been organizing, been an activist for years, always done it um, never been paid for it she worked in Georgia and uh, she's working with immigrant farms down there I think she got a couple of public health facilities or um, uh, clinics built for them and so she's been around the country doing this work for a long time and uh, has been a good friend of mine working on uh, coal campaigns in Iowa so and by coal campaigns you mean campaigns to shut, to shut the dirty down the, things shut down the dirty right? things down there absolutely so she worked with physicians for social responsibility for a while and uh, She'll, she'll tell us more about what she does, but a uh, good friend, great uh, great organizer, and uh, awesome activist. So. That's terrific. You know, we, we should have, uh, we have some pretty awesome uh, physicians for social responsibility members and activists, you know, nearby. We should have them on. They did um, I, um, the first report that was sort of the seed for the book about the full health care costs of coal and what mm -hmm. the real social costs of burning coal to make electricity are. We we should delve into that a bit. Well Nick, yeah. Let's Andy Jamington, all those mm -hmm. all those folks out there. Who was the who came and spoke here? Uh, uh, Doctor Lockwood, I believe. Doctor Lockwood just had the new true, book. The true cost of coal though, mm -hmm. the whole cost of coal and if, yeah, it's very expensive and dirty. Yeah, just that uh, we don't pay for it in our electric bills precisely, so People forget that there's more of the cost that we don't we don't include the little kids breathalyzer we don't include the hospital bills for the um, old folks uh, like me and the going to the hospital with heart and lung problems we don't uh, count the cost to whole communities and that's something we need to talk more about um, and you know we're 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 working on it and we are uh, we're concerned about it. The big issues, the long term, the strategic issues about the cost of coal, about our climate, and you know. But let's let's get into some day to day, hour to hour stuff. How about how about it, John Pollock? Let's do it. Sounds good. Well, uh, for this evening, we do have some uh, light showers moving through the area. Uh, this is the last of the cold fronts that we're going to see for quite a while. In fact, till about the middle of next week. So from here on for about a week, it's going to feel a lot more like late April, early May. Lots of uh, highs, upper 60s to uh, 70s, even some low 80s maybe before we're out of this. Good drying weather. So this will be the time to uh, get in there once the soil dries out a little bit. If you have a garden that you want to till, uh, of course the grass is growing. Uh, a lot of the fruit trees, fortunately, for those of you who have fruit, uh, most of them are still in the bud. The uh, buds haven't broken yet, the flower buds, so they have been spared what otherwise could have been a fairly nasty late April freeze because we had so persistently cold weather and wet weather. It wasn't any fun for the humans, but really it's very good for the vegetation in this part of the state. We've had quite a bit of rain. The drought isn't over, but this is exactly what we needed to see in order to start breaking the drought. Now, 
we're part of a, a gradient, we'd call it, because in western Nebraska, it's still dry. They didn't get nearly the precipitation that we did. And further east, they got even more, and they're actually having flooding problems along the Mississippi River. Uh, the pe persistent pattern that we have been in is starting to change, though, with the warmer weather coming. Uh, what's happening is that we're no longer getting so much cold air straight out of the Arctic after every storm system. Uh, the upper winds have shifted, uh, and we're going to be having winds that are straight across from west to east, or even from southwest to northeast, which will bring in that much warmer weather. Now, there is w an indication of uh, another weather system coming in the middle of next week. This one also looks fairly strong. It won't have as much of a connection to the Arctic. However, it looks like it could still produce a cold, rainy period, and it's too early to tell where that thing's going to settle. Some of the weather models have it this far west. Some of them have it further east, and uh, it's just going to take a few days for uh, things to work themselves out in the forecast. But uh, for the next week or so, we're looking at some very pleasant weather, and uh, uh, a lot of things are, a lot of vegetation's really going to be taking off, uh, acting like uh, it's been waiting, which it has. Now, uh, some other parts of this pattern. Uh, I mentioned that the drought isn't over yet. We need quite a bit of consistent moisture the whole spring season to recharge our subsoil moisture. Uh, we might get that. On the other hand, uh, most of these uh, large-scale drought patterns uh, begin in the southwestern U.S. and spread our way, and the southwestern U.S. is still quite dry. They've had below normal precipitation, and that means that we have the potential still for the summer heat dome to build in early, the way it did last year. So anybody who's thinking that uh, this wet spell means the drought is over, uh, hold your horses. It's not over yet. This is a good trend, but we really aren't there yet. How much will it take for us to really break this, this drought? Well, what it's going to take is consistent rain. Uh, April, May, and June are our best recharge months. Those are the months where we're most likely to have more rainfall than we do evaporation out of any time in the year. So if we can keep getting these rains through May and June, uh, let's say a surplus of about half a foot of rain for the Omaha area, and we've got about two or three inches of that already. So what we need is, uh, say, five to six inches of rain in May, another five to six in June, and we'd be in normal shape going into the summer. Are we, we playing catch-up from last summer? I mean, we will we be good? Are. or We certainly all are we need? playing catch-up. Uh, so we need about six inches total here. Unfortunately, they need even more than that as you go west, and they're getting less. Uh -huh. So although right around Omaha and far eastern Nebraska, we are making some real good progress on breaking the drought. The further west you get, the less favorable it is. And the, there has already been a high pressure aloft over the Rockies, uh, which is the dry pattern for the western U.S. But and does, doesn't a lot of the water we get, uh, especially down the most important river, the Platte, isn't that largely dependent on water that runs off of the Rockies? Well, it is. So there's going to be a problem there. Uh, what uh, the, and they're going to be holding back water this year uh, because they, uh, they, the people with the senior water rights are the ones that get it. So the uh, flow on the plat is certainly going to be diminished unless we can get this wet pattern spreading further west. Uh, what we really need is another few big storm systems that go right up to the Rockies. We had a couple of them. And it was somewhat helpful, but they are so far behind that we're going to need to see several more really good wet systems in uh, western Nebraska into Colorado and Wyoming in order to uh, 
get anywhere close to our normal water flow on the plat. And now we're here here in Omaha, just a, a couple of miles uh, down the street from the Missouri. And the Missouri, of course, downstream, they're they're screaming that they're flooding and the levees are breaking and are about to break. And people are genuinely worried with with good reason. But you know, the further upstream you get into the west, that's not the case, huh? Exactly. The uh, the water storage behind the, all the dams, which are uh, upriver of Sioux City, is uh, below normal at this point. And in fact, it isn't the Missouri River that is flooding. By and large, it's the Mississippi and the tributaries that come into the Mississippi like the from Illinois. the east. Yeah. yeah, the Illinois, the Ohio River has got plenty of water in it and those kinds of things. Uh, further west, uh, Iowa and Missouri have had more rain than we've had, but overall not enough to make bad flooding, uh, at least yet. In this next week, things are going to dry out, too. So uh, it's going to take uh, another several good storms before uh, the area is really back to recharge, even from uh, eastern Nebraska to points east. Now, we, we talked last week when we had that very annoying guest who was bicycling in 70 and 80 degree weather in Pennsylvania, and we were freezing our little uh, hind parts off. Mm. And um, sorry, Pat, no, mm. that, that was great, and I'm happy they have it. I wish, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're going to get a piece of that this week, huh? Yes, we will. And now we, we've been having the, the way the, the jet stream has sort of looped down, is that right? It's sort of this big hernia sort of looking thing in the middle of the country and to the west and the east, they have radically different weather than we do, right? Oh, yes. Uh, but the uh, the meteorologists have a term for that pattern, and it's blocking. Mm -hmm. That's when uh, not only do, are the, uh, the jet stream and the wind currents in the upper uh, parts of the atmosphere uh, going more north to south than east to west, uh, but also they're not changing very much. For the last three months, we've had a high pressure ridge over the Eastern Pacific or the general vicinity of the West Coast, and that takes the cold air from the, uh, oh, from Alaska and directs it down through Western Canada into the Central Plains states, and then it goes back north and uh, the east is relatively warm. That's the pattern that's starting to change. Uh, we the uh, the ridge that was out over the Pacific is showing signs of breaking down and rearranging itself, and we'll just have to see how that one turns out. The predictability when the the blocking pattern breaks down is rather low. Uh, another interesting thing is that uh, there is reason to think that some of this blocking is due to the disappearing ice cover over the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this is a long-term climate change uh, issue, and it's contributing. It's not the only factor of the blocking. We've certainly seen periods of uh, a lot of blocking in the past. Uh, and uh, it's last year, in fact, was blocking in the spring. Only last year, we were in the warm part. So it kept warm, and it pretty much stayed warm until uh, mid-April we had one bad cold spell. And then it kind of went back to being warm again. It, the pattern broke down for a little bit, but it was amazingly persistent. And this persistence is tied in, at least in part, to the thinning ice cover over the Arctic Ocean because the, uh, these air currents, the strength of the jet stream, is related to the temperature difference between the tropics and the polar regions. And if the temperature difference isn't as large, then the air currents can be more leisurely. So when they're more leisurely, they can loop and meander and slow down. It's, uh, if you look at, for example, the Missouri River compared to a mountain stream, the Missouri River is a more leisurely river. Uh, it's got a lot of miles to go to get to the, uh, the Gulf Coast, and uh, it kind of loops around, and uh, it doesn't go in much of a straight line. But a mountain stream, which goes down very fast, it has to get where it's going fast, 
tends to run in a much straighter line. It's the same thing with the atmosphere, except, of course, there aren't any banks. So the air currents have a lot more freedom to move around and rearrange themselves, and it's all really pretty complex and not entirely predictable. You know, I, I, I've been curious myself, having heard that the melting ice in at the North Pole, the, the Arctic ice, which is floating ice, um, that that has a big, can have a big effect on, on our weather. And, and maybe next time we have you, you can, you can explain how some of those factors work for us, us lay people. It, it may be sort of difficult for folks like me, but um, I, I think there's some interest in that because we hear all these things, oh, the ice is melting, and some people go, yeah, well, so what? And so what may be important? The, the, you know, that was a good scientific explanation, but um, coming, coming from me, I moved here last year. It was hot last summer. Mm -hmm. It was extremely hot. I hardly left my house. It was so hot. Um, I have never seen it as dry and warm as I, as, I, uh, as I saw it last year. And I didn't have to cut my lawn once living in Lincoln, not once. They, they combined crops in late August. It's mm -hmm. the first time I've ever seen that in my life. I've lived in the Midwest most of my life. So those are the real effects that the people in the region are, are facing. And it's, it's interesting hearing how much rain we're going to need and, and what the outlook is for the summer. Because you know, so surprisingly, I don't think the, the – although crops nationwide, they were below average last mm -hmm. year. But they, I don't think it was significant enough – across the country to get people to realize the severity of the problem. In Nebraska, it was definitely the worst, but um, you know, those are the effects that people are, fi are facing. Um, you know. And, and it's, it's very rele uh, relevant to um, the, the cl not only the climate, but the Keystone XL pipeline we're going to be talking about in a few minutes because the, one of the problems with that pipeline is it crosses the wettest part of the aquifer, which is one of the reasons that Nebraska agriculture was not clobbered any worse than it was, because a good, a good part of our crops were irrigated, and so the numbers weren't as horrible as they could be. But if you spoil any significant part of that or overdraw from any significant part of that aquifer, you know, that, that could change here in, in a quick, huh? Oh, yes. The... Uh there are two different aspects to that that I'm going to touch on very shortly before we go to uh, the next person. But uh, one of them is that Nebraska actually modifies our weather by doing all the irrigation that we're doing from the aquifer. The extra water that we pump out onto the crops evaporates, cools the ground in the summer more than it would be otherwise, and that actually shows up is a slower summertime warming in Nebraska than uh, we have further north. So uh, it's we're actually sort of a cool anomaly because of the water that we're successfully pumping out of the Ogallala Aquifer. The other aspect that of the Keystone is uh, I like the phrase lighting the fuse to a carbon bomb because when you make the oil easy to get out of the ground and ship through the pipeline, then you are opening up an absolutely enormous store of carbon. Uh, and just getting that started is a very dangerous thing. It is as dangerous as lighting a fuse because the, uh, it's going to be hard to shut off once it's started and because there is enough carbon contained in the uh, Canadian tar sands, if it were extracted to produce half the global warming that we have seen from all causes in the last hundred years. So let, let, me, let me get this straight. If we've had um, a, a degree of warming roughly yes. uh, so far from, from human causes, from burning oil, burning coal, deforestation, burning down the forest to clear land for agriculture, um, all those causes, you're saying that from this one kind of so-called unconventional oil 
in Canada, the tar sands. Just one deposit, yeah. Just the Alberta tar sands? Yep, just the Alberta tar sands. It's such an enormous deposit. It's so large and deep that if they were to successfully mine all that, and the Keystone Pipeline is a stage in that because that makes it economical to really go full speed ahead and hard to quit. If they were to succeed in mining all that, they get a third of a degree of global warming compared to the two-thirds that we've had so far. And that third of a degree is a quarter. Just that one deposit put, puts us a quarter of the way to the uh, critical uh, two-degree warming that it's kind of uh, no turning back for this system. And I'm going to provide more detail on where that two degrees comes from at a, on a later show. Love it's it. not an arbitrary number, but it's not exact either. Well, you know, it's, it's <laughs> one of the depressing little quips we come up with is to say we're not quite sure because we've never screwed up a planet this way before. <laughs> you know, and we really are, as unbelievable as it is, with this tiny little portion of the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide, the CO2, we really have altered it just enough to to really change how much heat. And, you know, that was one of the things that how much heat it holds. That was one of the problems I had in really believing this stuff was real because it's CO2 is, what, a half a percent of the atmosphere or something? We just oh, increased that it's some. It's a lot and, less than that. And but we can still yeah. just tweak it a bit, and we and we change how the dynamics of the whole climate system. That seems pretty un, unbelievable until you realize, yeah, look out the window. Well, and I, this gets into more than I, you know, <laughs> it, you've just bitten off at least a half hour's worth of, of subject. Oh, and, and let's uh, see, I think we've we got have about three minutes here. Two, <laughs> you two can do it. To, no, just no, kidding. Just kidding. No. Uh, I don't want to tackle that one tonight. I'll just say that uh, you're right and that you can measure the heat trapping properties of carbon dioxide in a lab and do the math and start to work it out from there. And you realize that what we're doing is actually enough to create a significant problem. And this really isn't new news, as, as I recall. Um, and you know what we ought to do? I think we need to have a couple of websites we give out every every week, like the American Geophysical Society, I think it is, hosts the book, um, um, The Discovery of Global Warming, and in which they describe in the process of inventing chemistry itself mm -hmm. 150 years mm -hmm. ago, or roughly yeah, speaking, that. Yeah. That, yeah. that they, they that's when they figured out that CO2 had this interaction with, with heat rays, with heat, with long wave wave radiation and so this is this is sort of old news this global warming stuff mm -hmm. right well the the simplest way to explain it is that almost all the atmosphere is made up of molecules with one or two atoms the main constituents of the atmosphere are nitrogen uh, 78 percent oxygen 21 percent and both of those are uh, molecules with two atoms and uh, argon is 1%. Everything else is so-called trace gases. Uh, but if you've got more than two atoms in a molecule, that gives that molecule extra ways to wiggle. Uh, it can go around in circles. It can wiggle back and forth. And those extra modes of vibration allow it to capture uh, radiant energy at different wavelengths. And that's what makes carbon dioxide so effective, along with methane and water vapor, for that matter. They all have more than two atoms in the molecule. So it comes down to some basic chemistry. All right. I hope my uh, high school chemistry teacher is listening. One quick question. Listening. When are my allergies going to go away? <laughs> yeah, ditto on that. <laughs> oh, boy. You're, you're asking a medical question. Oh, 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 there. oh, oh, oh. That's a dance. That's well, a dance. We'll give you till next week. All right. <laughs> because there, there's and there's a lot of things to talk about on allergies. Because talk about add, adding insult to injury. Although it pretty much feels like injury if you have allergies. Um, there, there's a number of ways that the increased CO2 and the increased um, uh, heat actually play on um, play on allergies. Goldenrod, you know, not bigger, better, nastier. 
pollen and, and so forth. So, you know, stay tuned for the sci-fi movie version of global warming here. Don't talk goldenrod with me. It's the state <laughs> flower, and it doesn't cause allergies. Oh. It's the other stuff that blooms at the same We're not time. Here, so. <laughs> I'm going to give you an ecology lesson sometime on that. We'd love to have it too. Um, all right, you know we we're, we've referred to the pipeline, and now what we want to do is um, we're going to try and find Adam because he was there, and we want to talk to him about it. Yeah. So we have Adam Hintz coming on to give us an update on the pipeline here shortly. And then after Adam, uh, we'll have Mary Beth Gardam on with uh, Move to Amend to talk about Citizens United and um, a little bit about how that affected how corporations um, affect politics. So is Adam coming on? You got him? Well, 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 John's trying to get a hold of Adam. I want to talk a little bit about something, as many of you have read in the news, uh, the Omaha Herald today um, and yesterday talked about uh, Facebook putting a new data center. Uh, they had an opportunity to, to um, look over uh, Iowa and Nebraska and um, you know weigh the benefits of putting a data center in one of these two states and at the end of the day they chose Iowa and uh, with the statement that Facebook just made recently um, they you know Facebook uh, has a 25 percent renewable energy standard by 2015 and to meet this and you know, they weren't going to meet it coming to Nebraska right now uh, we get around four four percent of our energy from renewable energy in the state Iowa's closer to 20 so they, they chose Iowa over Nebraska, and that's something that uh, we'll be talking more about. That's something more we'll be talking about in the coming weeks, because this is a big deal for Nebraska. So I think we got Adam on the phone. Let's uh, let's switch to him. Adam, I believe we're here, aren't we? Are we there? Let's see. Uh, we are at. Testing one, two. We're still trying to figure out our the technology in this Testing. station. Adam, can you can you hear us at all? You can. Well, we can't <laughs> hear you. We have our our technical wizard coming up. Okay. Can, I talk uh, more? Good. can we do a mic check on you? Say your name, Adam. Uh, you got your phone on speaker. Take your phone off speaker. Okay. okay. Okay, put it. Yeah, take speaker off. All righty, hold on just a second, Adam. We're wiggling wires over here like crazy. And um, let's see if we can try the other. Uh, let's try a different wire and a different uh, mute button here. All righty, I heard a pop on the mic then. Test two. Oh, we okay. Go. I think we've Test got one. you, Adam. All right. Okay. Thank you, hey. Pipeline Fighter Adam. That's great. Adam, your last. I keep wanting to call you, uh, keep wanting to call you Heinz, like the ketchup, but that's not your name, is it? No, no, no. It's helpful hints. 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 Okay. Like yes, a, helpful hints. Helpful yeah. hints. Well, that's you, man. Yeah. Uh, Adam, <laughs> the helpful hints. I love it. Thank you, Mr. King. We appreciate your help there. Uh, he's the man who really knows what what he's doing around here, and we're we're mighty happy about it. So <laughs> now, Adam, you you actually are a radio guy yourself. You participate in Earth to Lincoln on KZUM Community Radio in Lincoln every Tuesday right. at six thirty, right? That is absolutely correct. Yeah, for I um I take care of the airways here in Lincoln while you take care of the airways over there in Omaha <laughs> and worldwide. After all, and worldwide, that's true. <laughs> and unfortunately, folks are inflicted. Uh, we we have inflicted a video stream on our listeners, so. And oh, lucky six. them. They get to see your handsome face then. <laughs> One of ours. Um. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we don't need to go here, okay? <laughs> okay, all, all of that. And in addition, you're a, a proprietor at Meadowlark Coffee and Espresso in Lincoln. That's right, yeah. I, um, I'm, I'm the lucky person that was able to open a coffee shop right next to a food co-op and... Um, I've been doing that for eight years now, thankfully, and, uh, you know, 
it's a great I'm, I live a really charmed life. I'm very happy uh, living here in Lincoln, owning my own business, uh, being my own man, controlling my own destiny. It's and wow. you know helping the community out as much as I can. You know, and I feel like that's my responsibility. I've been so fortunate. It's, it's uh, you know, it's it's my duty then for being fortunate to help others get well, find their fortune in life. We we very much very much appreciate that and and just. You know, I'm in there how many times a week, Adam? Three, four, five times a week and, and more when you're yeah. not there. Well, and honest, it, it I really visits like fourteen times a week, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but who's counting? The and, and yeah, honest I, I appreciate it every time. And I really do pay for that second cup of coffee, you <laughs> dropping the coins in the bowl. Honest I do. Yeah, know? me too. <laughs> okay. I trust you. I trust you. That's fine. Good. I'll now, keep my eye on you, but I trust you, yeah. <laughs> All righty. Now we're we we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago with you by phone uh, talking about the getting ready for last week's uh, State Department hearing about the XL pipeline and that hearing has happened. There's a terrific uh, YouTube video out just a couple of minutes uh, worth that 350.org put out. Just found out about that. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it yet. But I have. Yeah, it, it is a really well done piece. Um, you know, really represents uh, the indigenous angle, the landowner, rancher, farmer angle, um, and just our passions, how strongly we feel about this pipeline not, or this pipeline never existing. Um, this is, uh, you know, an eminent threat to our way of life, and uh, we just will not let it happen. I was able to watch that. Now, I, I have to admit, I started out that morning um, – with three other people, uh, three other pipeline activists, uh, to to go to the hearing, and just I want to tell this just so people who are not uh, nearby can understand how impressive it was to have a thousand people at that hearing. Uh, we started yeah. out and and began to see cars on the side of the road because there was snow, not heavy snow, but mm -hmm. very heavy wind, and the snow was going horizontally across the road. We started seeing cars on the side of the road. We saw a semi turned over on the side of the road and then the car next to us on the on the interstate 80 westbound hit a little ice and began to fishtail and because they had no traction that wind blew them off the road and i have to admit i turned around and came the heck home so it's, yeah it's, no I, that's totally understandable you know i was wondering myself on the way out there you know how many people um, you know, will be would be injured and hurt. You know, just to go and defend their land and water. Um, and you know, I was determined. I, I left Lincoln at about 5:30. Uh -huh. um, once I got to about York, it started to get icy. Mm -hmm. um, and to the point, you know, luckily I have this all-wheel drive car, so I was able to control uh, myself pretty well on that very slick ice. It was fresh, fresh sleet on the interstate. Um, and we were going at about 30 miles an hour down that interstate. Everybody was. Yeah, that was, um, it was. It was quite an event. It, well, luckily, Priuses it, are like bumper cars, too. You know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, you know, it. it, uh, it they shut down the interstate at Aurora, mm -hmm. and so I had to turn off and take Highway 34 west into Grand Island. Thankfully, uh, my bat phone was uh, <laughs> able to direct me how to get to uh, the the fairgrounds there in Grand Island, because I don't think I would have been able to find it otherwise. That's it was, pretty amazing. It was a whiteout, and uh, it was quite an event. Um, but, you know, a, a, a thousand people were determined to get to that. And they were um, they were waiting they, outside in this weather for hours, right, to get in? They were. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I know some people, I, I imagine, I, I think they opened the gates at 7, people lined up. Um, I got there at about 8.30. There was two entrances that were available to make a line. There's a north side and a south side. A lot of people lined up on the south side. I went on the north side since there was fewer people. I thought I'd be able to get in line. I had a line first. Um, and we stood out there for like uh, an hour. It seemed like a long time. Um, I brought some coffee along, obviously, uh, <laughs> keeping warm. And, uh, you know, but, but our spirits were really high, and that's what kept us you know, um, strong in this, you know, and we're real Nebraskans. We can handle this stuff. You know, we've, we've gone through worse things, and um, we just held our ground and sat, you know, stood there. And some people had uh, sleeping bags, cut, you know, wrapped around them to keep them warm, but 
we stood our ground and we stayed there. Um, one of the big fears was that the unions were going to come in and get all the, the, the first first to speak places. And uh, so we had to make sure that didn't happen. So luckily, um, the, the people that are organizing the hearing, they came out and said, hey, you know, we really feel sorry for you guys standing out here in the cold. We'll have you come in. And so thankfully, they had us go into a different part of the uh, it, the like, convention center there. And um, we stood indoors uh, from about 9 o'clock to about 11 when they allowed us to start going through the metal detector. And then we got our numbers. And luckily, I was number eight. Wow. And, um, yeah, thankfully, um, I know a lot of pipeline fighters got really good positioning at the very beginning of the hearings. I was one of those lucky people. And, um, you know, I was planning on writing my testimony between the time I signed in and the time I testified the time I testified, um, but I barely had any time for that. Wow, that's, so, uh, that's an amazing I just, story. I just wrote down, I just, I just scribbled real quick, you know, what was in my heart and what I thought was really important to say to the State Department and President Obama, and I, I went up there, and, and we all stood up uh, in solidarity with each other, and um, it, was, it was a powerful event. 200 people uh, spoke in opposition uh, to this pipeline, while only 26 spoke in support. Wow, were they um, like the the company guys or what? Yeah, I mean that's that's the assumption. Most most of them were just company guys that were there that were actually getting paid to be there. The other 200 people, they they're volunteers. You know, they're not people that that were there. You know, just because that's their job. Besides the job of protecting their land and water, um, and hopefully this will pay off. So it was. It really was the the people who were paid to be there. <coughs> excuse me. And uh, versus uh, the the residents. Now, of course, there were a few people who who are able to get part of their income from participating in this. But the the amount of money uh, that the pro pipeline, the oil industry forces, bring to bear is millions and millions of dollars. And we're talking the money we can scrape together in the tens of thousands. That's how. That's the David and Goliath story we're talking about. Exactly, yeah. And I, I do think that, uh, you know, with the State Department hearing, you know, we uh, we threw that riot rock right in Goliath's forehead. It was, <laughs> it was a really good, um, it was a great showing by, by Nebraskans. And people from out of out of uh, the state, there was a gentleman from Port Arthur, Texas, who um, works on uh, keeping his community healthy, which obviously is a huge challenge down there because there's so much oil and chemicals flowing down to Port Arthur, Texas. He talks about how, he, you know, he stated how horrible this pipeline would be for his community. Uh, someone from North Carolina was there. The people that are suffering from the, the, the Arkansas tar sand spill came and testified to say, look, this is what happened to us. Don't let this happen to the Nebraskans that care about their land and water. Don't let this happen to them. Um, so, you know, they, it wasn't just a Nebraska thing. It, it, this is a national issue. It's a global issue. We're right in the middle of it. And I'm just so thankful that we have so many Nebraskans that are passionate and care about this issue so much that they brave the odds to get to Grand Island. What are the next steps now? It was an amazing hearing. What do you know anything about? And I know people are asking, when are we going to know? When are we going to know? What what's the outcome of this? What, what 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 can you say on that? Well, I mean, as far as the timeline, there's no real. I don't feel like there's much of a hurry as far as making a decision one way or another. Um, the, the good news and what may help this thing be decided on was is that the EPA Monday uh, sent out a uh, criticism of the environmental impact statement uh, of the State Department saying that it was insufficient, um, citing that there were a lot of holes, a lot of shadows in this report that are not being addressed, um, which was which is a huge win um, for the land and water because, um, you know, EPA, that's their job to protect the environment, and when they say, "Hey, this is a this thing, this report is flawed," um, I guess the real reason is because Trans Canada doesn't want to own up to the truth that this pipeline is poisonous and will hurt us. 
So it's and so that the, as the, far the, as the timeline goes, um, you know, the Congress right now, uh, Lee Terry, our <laughs> humble con or is he? A, I think he's a congressman or a senator. Uh, he put up a, a bill, or he's a part of a bill or something, where he's trying to get this thing um, approved as quickly as possible. And they tried that last time uh, with the last permit for the Keystone XO, and that fast tracking actually ultimately uh, put pressure on Obama just to say, "No, we're not going to do this. Then there's not enough. There's not enough uh, research on it." So. Yeah, and the, the the Environmental Protection Agency is is well named. That's their job, and when they weigh in um, on their specialty against the State Department's re environmental report, and that is not only not their specialty, it was written by an oil industry firm. Their re the State Department report was. I I, I agree. It 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 carries a tremendous amount of weight, and you know I got to give. You folks that have been on the pipeline fight longer than I, it's a, a lot of credit. Somebody asked me today uh, and yesterday and for several days in a row now that I think about, about it, people have asked me, do you think we can win? And, you know, I don't like happy talk. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pretty cold-blooded realist. And I, so I had to pause and think, but I, I felt very good about saying, well, two years ago, the assumption was that this was a done deal. The oil industry wanted something, and we everyone expected the folks in D.C. who have the authority to sort of roll over, stick all four feet in the air, and say whatever you want whenever you want it. And instead, we have fought them to a standstill against great odds for this long. That is a tremendous win. And I, I tell me, has it changed anything in the middle of Nebraska? Have have people been affected by this? Well, I definitely think that it, it is it, it is changing the zeitgeist, I think, of the state in a way where people from all different walks of life are coming together and understanding that our commonality is, is the ecology of, of Nebraska. And, you know, that's the one thing, no matter what, what other belief system we may have, I think we all understand that at the very bottom of it, we all share this planet, and we all share you know, the Platte River um, watershed. We all share the Ogallala Aquifer. Um, and that's something that is, the, at the very base, our life source, the thing that gives us life. And to have that kind of ecological consciousness come up, I think, is very important. Now, I'm not saying that there's a huge upswell of activism going on, you know, uh, throughout the state, like we're becoming some sort of amazing water blue state. But I do think um, the idea of, of active patriotism and activism and advocacy, and, and that sometimes when you do speak to power, it changes power. And um, I, I'm interested to see how this is going to play out for Republicans in the state, and um, how how this will change the political landscape of Nebraska. Amen. Amen to that. You might be right. You might be right. A Adam, we're going to have to to let you go. We want to have you back again. Keep your ear to the ground. Uh, we want to have some of our other uh, Lincoln activists, like Mary Pfeiffer, uh, on to talk about uh, uh, her activism and her new book, The Green Boat. We want to have other folks from that group, but we definitely want to have you back if you're willing. Oh, yeah, anytime. Just let me know. I'm more than willing to chat with your community. Thank you so much, Adam. Good night, and thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Adam had a good point talking about patriotism. Uh, since I've worked around the country on different campaigns, I haven't seen a more patriotic group of people than the people in Nebraska working to preserve the land and the water here in the state. Um a good friend and colleague of mine the other day said that um, he heard a, a Native American speak at an event that he went to, and the Native American said, um, you know, it's not so much that we fight for our children, but our uh, our enemy's children. So, um, and that's what we're doing here in Nebraska. That's what, that's what the fight is about. So we're going to go to our next caller here. Her name's Mary Beth Gardham. And she's a good uh, friend of mine. I've worked with her um, off and on for 
well, about five, six years ago. Um, she now works for Move to Amend. And um, she, I think she's on, yeah, we got her on the phone. So let's let's bring Mary Beth on. I bet we'll you get 50 it. cents I can even find the right wire and the right switch. Mary Beth, are you there? Yes, I am. Terrific, and we can hear you. So that's that's great. Hi, great. Mary Beth. Can you, you? Hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, wonderful. Thanks for coming on. Uh, this is John Atkinson here, the co-host, and uh, you're on the Environmental Report. And, um, you know, I, I asked you to come on. You've been a, a good friend of mine. I know we haven't communicated that much in recent weeks, but you're doing amazing things in Iowa, and I want you to um, tell the people on air about Move to Amend, uh, we just got done talking about Trans Canada, the pipeline issue in Nebraska, and how much power Trans Canada has had um, in this fight. And I think what you're doing is kind of, you know, the other side of things, addressing that power and calling that out. So, uh, tell us a little bit about Move to Amend and um, what you're doing in Iowa. Uh, well, Move to Amend is a uh, is a coalition of. Uh, individuals and organizations um, of many different types. Uh, we're pretty diverse. Uh, we're nonpartisan. Um, we're environmentalists. We're uh, democracy proponents. We're um, energy uh, policy people. We're um, uh, peace and uh, justice people. Um, all of whom have come to realize over the years that um, the issues that we care the most about and the hopes that we hold dearest for our country and our planet are um, very often obstructed by the power that corporations have gained and the wealthiest individuals um, in, the, in the country to influence our government and set our policies. So um, that's that's kind of what Move to Amend is about. We're trying very hard to get a constitutional amendment which will uh, affirm that a corporation is not a person and should not be um, should not be entitled to the same constitutional rights that human persons are entitled to and that were meant by our founders for human persons, and they, um, and that money is not speech and must be regulated in order to keep the wealthy ruling elite from uh, calling all the shots in our government. How does this relate to the Citizens United decision in 2010? Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know some of our listeners might, might not be familiar with, with what happened there. They... Uh, in 2010, uh, the, the Supreme Court um, made a decision, a ruling, which uh, affected the ability of corporations to contribute uh, pretty much unlimited amounts of money from their corporate treasuries towards uh, political campaigns and elections. Um, it was a, a devastating uh, Decision, and it, it, but it was it was far from the beginning of this process. Um, the the ruling uh, is really the latest in a series of decisions from the Supreme Court that date back all the way to the 1800s, which have granted corporations rights as human beings, allowing them to avoid regulation and resulting in uncontrollable corporate influence over politics. It's kind of like they created a corporate Frankenstein. <laughs> that's, um, that's pretty scary. So uh. <laughs> well, the first ruling that uh, really uh, set things in motion uh, was in 1886. It was the Santa Clara versus the Southern Pacific Railroad case. Uh, and that was just a case about taxes. It was a simple case that had nothing at all to do with corporate personhood. But uh, the court clerk, who just coincidentally happened to be a retired railroad executive, 
um, wrote in the head notes of the case, uh, we, uh, the judges never discussed whether corporations were persons. They all agreed that they were, which on its face is kind of unbelievable because how could they all agree on something without discussing it? And if they discussed it, why wouldn't that discussion have appeared in the notes from the case? So it was a very gratuitous um, head note, and uh, it followed probably 20 years of court cases where co where corporations had tried to nail down constitutional rights for themselves and had failed because there was never enough uh, legal uh, ra rationale to give them the rights of human persons. But in 1886, with that court decision, uh, what they did was uh, they uh, stole personhood rights, and soon afterwards, many, many cases followed which used that case as a precedent. So that by the time the 2010 Citizens United case came around, uh, when they pointed towards this 1886 decision and the precedent on which they were basing their decision, um, it was really kind of laughable because it was an illegal decision um, from the time it was put in place. And to have that be what they what they based Citizens United on is is really very disturbing. So it's a, a matter of uh, legal precedent and legal history that's built one thing on top of the other, and so that's that probably makes it a pretty big obstacle uh, that that precedent that history and and is that why you've decided the only way to overturn it is to go to a a constitutional amendment, which also sounds like a pretty darn big deal. Um, yes, that's why we've decided on this course of action and amendment. And yes, it is a pretty big deal. Um, but um, there have been 27 amendments so far, and uh, we feel that this 28th amendment is, is an important one for the future of our country. So we're committed to go through with it. Uh, you can Google the, um, or you can you can search the amendment that we're um, proposing. It's called the We the People Amendment, and it's at www.wethepeople.org. Say that again: um, www.wethepeople.org. We the People Amendment. Sorry, we, dot org. We the we People, people Amendment. Dot org. Dot org. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and it, it's a ruling. It's an amendment language that's very hard for people to argue with, whether you're on the right or you're on the left. Um, the, the common enemy we face right now is corruption, and um, this amendment, which talks about um, corporations not being persons and money not being speech is a way of regulating the money that um, goes into our elections and really protects our the integrity of our elections and our, our very democracy. How much money was spent on the last elections from corporations uh, uh, donate, you're giving that to PACs, political action committees? Um, do, do you know? I, I don't it, I don't know, that's why. I think it's I think it was something like uh, twelve billion dollars. I mean, it was it was an amazing amount of money. I know that in uh, in Iowa, there was more spent on this past election than in the last uh, several elections be, be, before it. Um, you can go to www.demos, D-E-M-O-S, dot org, and they have a section on uh, campaign financing, which has wonderful charts and graphics uh, that, and, and figures and statistics that 
talk about exactly how much money was contributed, how much more money in 2012 than previous elections, and where that money came from. And of course, one of the most disturbing parts is that um, the corporations that and, and individuals that gave money, many of them were able to give that money through what they call dark money sources without ever revealing who they were. So it's entirely possible that a lot of money uh, went to that election from corporations and individuals who aren't even in America. Uh, and that's, that's what we're uh, getting at. Corp- through that transparency, but it's, it's something that we feel very strongly about, too. When you have $12 billion to influence an election, that can that can fix an election, that can easily change the results of an election. Corporations should not be able to buy their represent, representatives. Uh, and, and the amazing thing to me is that they didn't get everything they wanted. They didn't get the president they wanted. They did not uh, expand the majorities they have in, in the House of Representatives or in the case of Lee Terry. Adam, I think the word you were looking for was misrepresentative Lee Terry. Um, we, you know, we, we just, it, it's a big mess and they really were not, even with that amount of money, able to make much headway, which is just remarkable. And the same thing is true with TransCanada. They, with the Keystone XL pipeline that we were just discussing, they have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in Nebraska to, uh, get what they want. And in fact, while some of the, uh, political structure does in fact appear to be for sale, the people of Nebraska clearly are not for sale. It's just a remarkable thing. And uh, move to amend is not a totally foreign thing in in Nebraska. We had uh, Mr. David Keith Cobb come through on the speaking tour. I imagine he was in Iowa too, right? Oh, he's been here several times. Yeah, he's a a perennial. David has uh, an unbelievable amount of energy. It's hard to keep up with him. It makes me tired to be in the same room with David K. Cobb. I got to tell you the truth. He was in my living room in 2004, giving a giving a speech, and afterwards I got him in a corner. And says, "Teach me how to do this. You, you, you're good at it." And by gosh, he took a few minutes and gave me some pointers I've never never forgotten. Not that you could tell it from me. Um, so what's next? Do you have any big campaigns, or is it just the slow day by day work for you right now, Mary Beth? Well, uh, we're, we are asking people to uh, contact their legislators in every state, really, uh, to, to call their attention to this uh, We the People amendment and ask them to get behind it. Um, in uh, Iowa, we have been approaching our legislators for the last two years, and uh, in January, we met with them um, at a, a, a soup and salad luncheon that we prepared, our volunteers, uh, in at the Capitol. And we were kind of amazed that a number of Iowa legislators told us that they had never heard of Citizens United and were totally unaware of what the impact of that was for Iowa and the United States. Um, it's kind of hard to believe that, you know, they wouldn't have heard of this. Yeah, and these but are politicos. Again, sorry? And and these are politicos. And, you know, I, I hate to cut you off, but we're about to get cut off. We're in our last minute. We want to thank you very, very much for coming on and sharing this with us. Thank you, Mary Beth. And for everyone out there, I believe the website was we the people amend- Amendment.org. That's right. And demos.org was the other one she mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thanks, Mary Beth. We appreciate it. We appreciate all our listeners. It's the top of the hour. It's been another environmental report, our our third Third one. one. Yeah, we made it this far. Here we go. We'll see you next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time. Thanks, Graham. See you. Bye, everyone.